Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Please kindly be seated as the panel discussion will begin very soon. I have a few housekeeping notes to make before we begin today's program. First of all, we would like to seek your cooperation to have your mobile phones. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as some of you might uh, have noticed, uh, I am not Kishore Mabubani. Uh, Kishore is uh, unfortunately away on medical leave, and he is unable to join us today, and he sends his deep, uh, deepest apologies uh, for that. Uh, I am, however, Kenneth Paul Tan, and I'm Vice Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, and it's really a great pleasure and a privilege to welcome you to our school, and also to this forum, on the enduring ideas of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, today, as you know, marks the first anniversary of Mr. Lee's passing. As you might know also, today's forum is one of more than 100 events organized in legacy of our founding prime minister. We have lined up a panel of speakers who will reflect on different aspects of Mr. Lee's multifaceted ideas, how they have been translated into practice and what influence they will have on the future course of Singapore. Senior Minister of State, uh, Chan Heng Chi, who is at the Singapore University of Technology and Design. And she will speak on the greening of uh, Singapore as a city. The third speaker, speaker is Dr. Subramaniam J. Shankar, who is Foreign Secretary of uh, uh, India, a Ministry of External Affairs of India. Uh, he will speak with Dr. Shashi Jayakuma, who is Senior Fellow and Head of, of the Center of Excellence for National Security at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies. And he will speak on party renewal and internal reform. I trust you will all find their views more than enlightening, and we look forward to your reactions and questions uh, later on uh, in the forum. Now it gives me great pleasure uh, to invite the NUS Provost, Professor Tan Ng Chai, to deliver his remarks. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This day, one year ago, Singaporeans bade farewell to our founding Prime Minister and one of our founding fathers, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Heartfelt tributes pour in from the world over. World leaders call him a great man and marveled at his vision, insights, and resolve. He was a leader like no other. Grateful Singaporeans grieved the passing of an incorruptible leader whose passion, vision, and tireless efforts have found and created a thriving and successful Singapore of today. One year on, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's life and work continue to shape Singapore. NUS and the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy are privileged to convene a panel discussion on the enduring ideas of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Much has been said and written about Mr. Lee. His great ideas, his remarkable qualities, and his many lasting contributions. One area that has struck me profoundly was his belief in his people. If I may quote a man met, Henry Kissinger, who wrote, fate initially seemed not to have provided Lee a canvas on which to achieve more than modest 
local success. But great men become such through visions beyond material calculations. Lee defied conventional wisdom by opting for statehood. The choice reflected a deep faith in the virtues of his people. He asserted that a city located on a sandbar with nary an economic resource to draw upon and whose major industry as a colonial naval base had disappeared, could nevertheless thrive and achieve international stature by building on its principal asset, the intelligence, industry, and dedication of its people. Education and people development became critical components of Singapore's nation building. In the late 1970s, even though Singapore had enjoyed strong, sustained economic growth for several years, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew identified the need to raise skills training and talent development to meet the growing demands of a newly industrialized, industrializing economy. He foresaw that the demand for more graduates and professionals would continue to grow a responsibility entrusted to the National University of Singapore, which was formed in 1980. Today, NUS is widely recognized to be one of the leading universities in the world. And in this, as with many institutions and achievements in Singapore, we owe much to the leadership and foresight of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. As many here would know, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew was very careful when it came to lending his name to institutions and awards. He consented only for causes that he was passionate about and where using his name served a greater purpose. He was intent on showing his support, the honor to glorify himself. Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong said that his father did not care for monuments, but he was chiefly concerned with the ideals and principles upon which he had built this nation. NUS is grateful that in spite of his aversion to self-aggrandizement, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew had generously allowed his name to be used for various academic prizes and awards. This speaks of his beliefs and commitment to education and talent development. It is the quality and virtues of our people that will build Singapore. First, we have the Lee Kuan Yew Distinguished Visitors Program, which allows NUS to invite internationally eminent and outstanding academics and scholars as Lee Kuan Yew Distinguished Visitors. Second, the Lee Kuan Yew Postdoctoral Fellowship Program supports the development of outstanding young academics in science, medicine, and engineering. The prestigious Lee Kuan Yew Scholarships set up in 1991 recognize outstanding individuals with the aptitude and inclination to contribute to our society. Scholars can either pursue masters or PhD programs at local or overseas universities. The Lee Kuan Yew Gold Medals introduced in 1996 are awarded to the best performing graduates throughout the course of study for 18 degree programs. In 2001, Mr. Lee generously donated the sale of his memoirs to create two Lee Kuan Yew prizes. These prizes are each awarded to the best student for the degree of Master in Public Management and the degree of Master in Public Policy. Finally, Mr. Lee also gave the proceeds of autograph editions of his books to the Lee Kuan Yew Scholarship to encourage upgrading award or LKY step 
The award recognizes upgrading and lifelong learning and is offered to outstanding polytechnic graduates pursuing full-time undergraduate degree courses at, the local, at local public universities. NUS is especially honored that Mr. Lee Kuan Yew agreed for the School of Public Policy to be named after him. Cabinet had convinced him that having such a school and associating his name with it would help establish the Singapore brand of governance and advance the school's mission to raise standards of governance in Asia, improve the lives of people, and contribute to the transformation of the region. Today, the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy not only rep represents Mr. Lee's deep insights and diverse experiences on the issues facing Singapore and the world, but also his enduring ties with NUS and his impact as one of the foremost thinkers in the world. It is thus most befitting and poignant for this panel discussion on the endure, enduring ideas of Lee Kuan Yew to be held at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. I would like to commend Professor Kishore Mabubani, Dean of the School, and his team for their hard work in putting together a very stellar list of speakers for today's event, some of whom are personally acquainted with Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. The panelists uh, will speak on Mr. Lee's ideas that are relevant for the future, spanning urban development and the shaping of the city, minorities and multiracialism, foreign policy, and on the People's Action Party, specifically on party renewal and internal reform. I trust that we will find this event meaningful as we quietly ponder the ideas of our founding father. May we lift up to the spirit of our eminent alumnus and Singapore's founding prime minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Thank you. Thank you, Provost, for the speech. I would now like to invite all the panelists up on stage for the panel discussion. Let's begin with the first speaker, and, and uh, he is uh, Mr. Zainal Avidin. Would you like to uh, give your remarks? Yeah. Up here. Thank you, Chairman. Provost, all my distinguished friends from university and outside and uh, respected panelists. A very good afternoon and welcome to this seminar in remembrance of our founding Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. One year on, I still miss him. Many do. But what he has left us will keep us on our toes for a long, long time his enduring ideas, his legacy, and what he believes in for Singapore means a lot to all of us who believes in Singapore. Lately, there have been many speeches about uh, the importance of multiracialism, social cohesion, and what it means for Singapore. From our Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Sian Lung, to the two Deputy Prime Ministers, Mr. Chiu Chi Hien and Mr. Taman Sharmagaratnam, and many other ministers, Mr. Heng Sui Kiat, 
also as a chairman of the SG50, it cannot be underestimated. Multiracialism is the cornerstone of our existence and our future. Multiracialism is the foundation of what we believe in in our Singapore. I have three areas which I'd like to touch upon. One, our independence and what multiracialism means to our founding Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, and uh, no better way than to quote him in what he has espoused in terms of what multiracialism is all about. Two, to share and to discuss perhaps later on how multiracialism is seen differently by different people, different groups, even intergenerational kind of interpretation, and what we we have done as Singapore to cope with the changes, including the institutions that we have in place. And finally, the lessons from multiracialism. But before that, I beg your indulgence uh, to share with you some anecdotes, my own personal anecdotes related to multiracialism. I'm sorry I can't speak four languages, but enough to say Selamat Datang. Ni hauma rumanandri. Wanna come? When, when I was in school back in 1964, even before independence, I was almost killed in racial riots. It was a Friday, a holy day for Muslims. We left school early to go to the mosque and only to, found out, to find out after I left school that curfew had been called because racial riots had broken out in Singapore. Me and my friends, a group of us from Raffles Institution, Bras Basarut, we hurried to the bus stops. No buses were available, all were full. Then a lorry came by and they waved at us, a group of us, mostly Malays, who can't afford private cars and transport, waiting for buses. And they waved at us and I saw an open deck lorry then I had a quick look, and I saw a Chinese driver. My God, I said, what do I do? Then I had another look, and I saw the attendant was a Malay. So I said, 50-50. <laughs> so we went on, on the lorry, and from uh, Hill Street, where the U.S. Embassy was, we drove down to Lavender, Lavender Street, where the MRT is now. And you know what? I saw the streets were lined up with young teenagers, all wait, waiting by the roadside, watching what's happening. And you just couldn't believe it, the lorry went dead. Right in that spot. And naturally, we all clambered out of the lorry, trying to get alternative transport. And those young teenagers, Chinese teenagers from the cottage industries nearby, saw this group of about 20 Malays Climbing down from the lorry, and the first thing went to their mind must be they were there to attack them. And the Chinese kids disappeared into the, the cottage industries and came out with acid bulbs, bicycle chains, iron rods, and pandemonium broke loose. I saw with my own eyes people being maimed, being killed. I managed to escape with a passing taxi with the door flung open. I just clutched on it and escape. But that was not the end of the story. When I reached Geelang Sarai, I saw the reverse. I saw Malays attacking Chinese for no reason other than because they come with different color of skin. That really made me determine that we must ensure there is racial harmony in Singapore. And that is why I've been a, a very ardent student of our founding Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Another anecdote I'd like to share it's also my trip to, uh, to, to Libya. I was invited by President Gaddafi to attend an international conference. And um, we were there to show that you know, everything else had failed. Capitalism was decadent. Communism was on the verge of collapse. Islam is the only answer. But to my pleasant surprise, the whole conference rejected his idea and said we wanted a more inclusive rather than an exclusive approach towards working out our problems then that was really very reassuring. And inclusivity, in, in fact, is indeed the way forward.
And after Libya, I went on to India or to visit uh, Sastre land. And from Madras, ran, ran to the uh, railway station, climbed on the last coach that was pulling out of the station, and I went to the coach. It happened to be a first-class coach. The inspector came and said, hey, you, you economy class, what are you doing in the first class? But the family that was in the coach told the inspector, he's all right, he's family. And that was a Hindu family who embraced me as family. And I found out later on that the Hindu family was going to the Catholic church and after the Catholic church to a Muslim shrine. That really made me feel what a lovely world you'd be if we have that kind of racial harmony. Now back to Singapore. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew went through a lot in Malaysia, if you know the history. And... Uh, Communalism, communism, communalism both from the Chinese Chauvinists and also the Malay Chauvinists. And it was really tough for him. But as we went out, he came very clear in his mind that it has to be multiracialism for Singapore. I quote an example from Mr. Lee. This country belongs to all of us. We made the country from mud flats. It is man, human skill, human effort which made this possible. You came, you worked for yourselves, yes. But in the process, your forefathers and my forefathers who came here, we built this civilization. This was in 1965, immediately after independence, and he spoke this at the Sri Narayanan mission. Very interesting, a very small minority community's function emphasized the importance of multiracialism. Then in Parliament in December 65, Mr. Lee said, I quote, Mr. Speaker, sir, we have, vest, we have a vested interest in multiracialism and the secular state for the antithesis of multiracialism and the antithesis of secularism holds perils of enormous magnitude, not just for the people living here in Southeast Asia, but dangers of involvement by big powers who see in such a conflict fertile ground for exploitation of either the ideological or other power interests. I think his mind was very clear. But at the same time, he also knows that, talk about just an equal society, we are starting from a very, very short starting line. And uh, he, did, he did say this also at the, national, the first National Day Rally in 1966. We are completely unrepentant, talking about the Malaysian experience that we set out to build a multiracial and for some time a multilingual, multicultural community to give a satisfying life to the many different kinds of people who've foregathered here in over 150 years of the British Raj. And we, in the end, on balance, decided to carry on with our multiracial experience, if you like to call it, just in Singapore alone rather than be forced into large scale conflict in Malaysia. Nothing has altered, not the basic data, nor our basic. What has altered are the circumstances in which we now find ourselves. This is just after independence. If groups are left behind either on the basis of language, race, religion, or culture, and if with these groups the line of division coincides with the line of race, then we will not succeed in our long-term objective of a, secure, of a secure future. This were his thoughts, and these thoughts remain relevant till today. But if you see our multiracial He said that's reality. The majority will have to protect the minority. And he emphasized that in many ways and many times. And he said, in fact, that because of what we went through in Malaysia, the Malays were very afraid. What if now the Chinese, who are the majority in Singapore, did the same what the majority in Malaysia, the Malays, did to the Chinese then? But that was why he went on to then establish various institutions, one after another, 
whether it's the GRC, the Interreligious uh, Protection of Minority Rights, uh, Interreligious Harmony Bill, and now, of course, we have the Constitutional, Constitutional Commission looking at whether there, might, there can be a tweaking of the elected. So I think we can see the way Singapore is moving forward, we must ensure that there's a better understanding. This better understanding is even more uh, urgent now because the Singapore profile of, society, of our people, our population is changing. Before we had 75% Chinese uh, from Singaporeans, and now we have an active immigration with different kinds of nationalities. Even the Chinese, among the Chinese, immigrant Chinese and local Chinese, there are tensions. In the local Indians and immigrant Indians, there are tensions. And the Malays also have their own uh, concerns as to how they can move forward in terms of opportunities, in terms of race relations. Things are evolving, things are changing. Really on top of the situation that there is greater understanding and greater harmony as we move along. Trust is still something work in progress. And in fact, even multiracialism is work in progress. There's a lot more to be done, and there's a lot more that demands, not only from the government in terms of the institutions, in terms of the practices. Um, the Malays still have the issue with Tudong, headscarf, with national service, SAF, and these are being discussed. And this are, you can see a lot of progress, you can see a lot of movement, but they are still, it is work in progress, it is multiracialism, Singapore style, just as we have secularism, which is Singapore style, which I call secularism with the soul, where in fact, nowhere else do you have a secular country with the Islamic Religious Council or Hindu Endowment Board as part of the formal institution of Singapore. We are unique, we have shown that we can do it without. We haven't had any racial riots in 1964. Even when we had riots in Malaysia in 1969, we were able to manage the situation because of a strong leadership that understands the need for multiracialism, the need for harmony, and the need for us to continue to live at peace with each other and to work together as one united people, the Singapore, Singaporean. So on that note, I'd like to say thank you very much to Lee Kuan Yew School for giving me this opportunity, especially on this very memorable day, on this day of, of passing of our founding Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. He will remain in our mind, in our hearts for a long, long time, and may his ideals, enduring ideals, last for the good of Singapore for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lionel. Our next speaker is Dr. Shashi Jaguma. Distinguished guests, dear friends, I knew Mr. Lee uh, not well towards the end of his life. So rather than claiming a deep familiarity with himself, his life, his ideas, his thoughts. What I'm going to do in the 14 minutes, uh, 30 seconds I have left is to attempt to shine a light on some aspects of Mr. Lee's core thinking when it comes to renewal, particularly within the, his party, the People's Action Party. And secondly, to bring out some aspects of what I feel are his critical uh, which later came to pass and had to come to pass for the good of not just the party, but the country as well. The PAP, as many of us know uh, in this room, considered it a, a fundamental duty to, uh, through leadership renewal, and this strand of the PAP's DNA comes directly from Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. For him, the sooner the process of political renewal starts, the better. Many of us know this, but what tends to have been forgotten, e even by some historians, is that the fact that the fact of the inducting of fresh talent began at a very, very early stage, at an extraordinarily early stage. The renewal story of the party really begins in 1966, by elections, as some of us uh, may or may not know, uh, caused by political bickering within the Barisan Socialist, the, the major opposition political party, and also by mass resignations on the part of uh, Barisan Socialist MPs. Um, 
there were a series of elections largely forgotten, by elections rather, three times that year, in 1966 alone, further by elections in 1967. Lee Kuan Yew's tactic, it, it seems to me, particularly for the late 60s and also in the 70s, as I'll show, is to use these occasions by elections uh, to bring out political office holders, to put them in the hot seat and to test them repeatedly, rigorously and ruthlessly. This happened in the 60s and 70s. There were by-elections in 1970, 77, 79. This is, of course, besides the GEs, the general elections of 72, 76 and 80, which were big renewal exercises in the GEs themselves, an average of between 10 to 15 MPs stepped down. So massive renewal exercises. What is important for present purposes is that Mr. Lee, much later on, looking back on this period, 60s, 70s, isolates this as a series of key moments. He says more than on one occasion that if it had not been for these opportunities, Singapore would have suffered. And during the campaigns, when he speaks, he emphasizes the point is getting, that the PAP is getting in, and I quote, new and young blood as part of its continuity and change program. In the 70s, he likes this phrase a lot. He's clear in his speeches at this time that there's a duty of self-renewal, and this can only happen if the young are blooded early, if they're given opportunities to gain experience and to gain confidence. He's, of course, speaking to the people. We know that. But he's also speaking to elements within the party, his party. We should remember there was a movement within the party, and it threatened to become a powerful movement at times, which was resisting not so much uh, the, the idea of renewal, but the pace of it. 15 new men between 1968 and 1980 became ministers. Some of these were uh, very, very bright people, including university dons, technocrats, high-level public servants. Uh, some of them, for some reason or another, did not make it, even though many of them had genuine intellect, caliber, and talent. During this time, of course, individuals did come through who became the core of the second generation leadership. Dr. Tony Tan, who's now a president, Go Chok Tong, S. Donna Balan, and uh, Ong Teng Chong. But my point really is that Lee Kuan Yew needed time in the late 60s to the 70s. If he had not tried in the 60s, 70s, if he had not had time to sift through, I think Singapore would have had a very, very different future. And who knows when the alternate histories were written, whether Singapore's apogee, its peak, would have seen to be the 1970s. Lee Kuan Yew needed time to work out what kind of people he needed because the successor team, and you know the second generation leaders who they are, they were very, very different people, but they had one thing in common. None of them would have come forward to serve in politics, I think, off their own back to off their own accord. The second point I want to make is the thoroughness with which he goes about uh, the, the mechanics of the, re the, the renewal process. In 1977, Lee Kuan Yew forms a, a small task force within the party, largely forgotten today. The job of this task force is headed by an MP who stands outside the established party. Monitor the new MPs to rank them meticulously and to assess their suitability for higher office. So Lee Kuan Yew bypasses the normal party bases and the normal party operatives. The new potentials are, if you like, broken in by this new committee, but they don't know it because they think they are assisting this party to do other things like party renewal work and, and party revamps. Lee Kuan Yew, what, what he really wants is to know who can operate by Lee Kuan Yew, who's natural with the ground. Uh, and that's Mr. Lee's way of going about things. So in the late uh, 70s, early 80s, when the committee still exists, the new leadership is microscopically tested out, tested out from all angles. And the committee I, I mentioned gives repeatedly over the years assessments, detailed assessments from all angles on these people to Mr. Lee. And even then, the uh, uh, information he gets is tested out uh, against information coming from Mr. Lee's other sources. Anyone who knows Mr. Lee will tell you that's actually the way he, he operates, the way, the way he works. And it's not without reason that Mr. Peter Ho, former head of civil service, has called Mr. Lee a one-man intelligence agency because that's actually how he worked. So <clears throat> a great deal of this, uh, uh, coming to my main point on renewal, is actually hardwired within the, the core DNA of the party. The search process, and I think many of us know this, kicks into place immediately after the last election. In fact, it's the first thing they do. 
inclusion of the large palpable sense of urgency. They cast their net far and wide. And so from the get-go, you have people who are screened, and some would say screened out of the process. It's a tough and exacting process. These pref what Lee tried in the 70s prefigures the later meritocratic assessments, holistic assessments of candidates who are judged to have potential. And of course, the process becomes a lot more systematized in the 1980s and 1990s. But I think that it's extraordinary that in the 70s, when so many other party leaders are preoccupied with other things, that Mr. Lee has time to think about this issue and to be preoccupied with it. No one else has the time, the energy, the wherewithal to think about these things. All this is persistently deeply rooted within not just the party, but other bodies like the administrative service and, and of course the civil service itself. And this is one of Mr. Lee's enduring ideas. You might get the impression from what I've said thus far that it's simply a matter of Lee seeing renewal and seeing it a little bit earlier and with a little bit more vision than everybody else. But I actually think there's more to it than that. It's not simply a renewal issue. To him, to Mr. Lee, the renewal issue is complicated by the fact that there is a lack of good quality opposition. So this has a blowback on the second generation of leaders who coming through are not able to be tested through the crucible of fire that Mr. Lee and his comrades did. So what does Mr. Lee do in response? He tries and tries repeatedly to encourage debate. On that day in 1965, when the Barisan Socialists uh, absented themselves from the assembly, Mr. Lee asked the speaker, until that such time as the Barisan MPs represent themselves or resign, he asked the speaker to put forward all the pros and cons of every legislation and every policy in the hope thereby of discharging the duties of an opposition. But more so, I hope you will allow considerable latitude amongst the backbenchers on the government side to take of their time to play the role of a constructive critic." End quote. So the backbenchers are being told to play the role of constructive Mr. Lee thinks the opposition cannot be and MPs I have interviewed o over many years now all agree that the 1970s was a critical, informative uh, period for parliamentary debate. Yes, there was no opposition throughout, but Lee on several occasions gets the MPs together and told them, look, you have to ask questions in parliament and play the role of a constructive opposition. They were urged to bring up views from the ground level and debunk them in a reasoned way if they could. So Lee's own view of doing this is that it's absolutely critical and that he succeeds. And he says in 1977, not bring out these differences in opinion. If we had not done so successfully since 1965, when the Barisan Socialist MPs walked out of the chamber, I do not believe in February 68, in 72 and 76, we would have been returned so unanimously and completely, end quote. So I should add junctions that he brings up to his MPs, how to be a foil. He likes this word, counterfoil how to raise points sensibly, bringing up real feedback to the ground, from the ground. And until he steps down as PM, this is the message. It is a message carried on by his successors. And this is certainly an, another enduring idea within the core DNA of the party. Now, getting backbenchers to speak up is one thing. However, even that is not the whole story. What really matters to Lee is getting the best ideas out and discussed no matter who you are. And I want to quote to you uh, something Mr. Lee says in the immediate uh, aftermath of the 1972 general election, this early morning traditional 3 a.m. press conference when the party, as usual, has won uh, without losing a seat. And Lee is, as usual, at these con press conferences in a reflective mood. And he says, and I quote, I think the problem of getting an intelligent, constructive opposition has got to be solved. Singapore just doesn't have the kind of people coming into politics they are not likely ever to develop into coherent, constructive, loyal opposition. So we're toying with, I don't know, we're toying with the idea of getting university seats, NTU, Singapore University, and so on, and another two or three institutions into parliament so that they don't have to belong to the PAP, they don't have to belong to, uh, be obliged to us, end quote. Again, the idea of a counterfoil. And he says at this point, we've got to solve this because no opposition is going to come in and solve the problem for us in the next few years. So I thought that this is really, really interesting. He wants a group who can come in and take on the PAP, no matter who you are, maybe from NTU, maybe from Singapore University, 
intelligent enough to point out where the government is wrong. My own view is that this is probably the actual origins of, although substantially modified, the nominated members of parliament NMP idea, which as you know, only comes into real being much later on in, in 1990. This is another enduring idea, if you like. It's not just the best people, it's the ideas. No matter where you come from, the best ideas have to come for, to the surface and the means and mechanisms must be created to allow them to surface and not be stifled. I'm coming to the end of my, my remarks now, but I want to give uh, a final example, if I have time, on his political foresight. And again, this is from the 1970s, which I think is the great undiscovered historical period in the party's formation. Uh, again, the party is at this point close to its peak without the semblance of a real opposition. I would argue it's at precisely this point when everyone is too busy that Lee sees further, further forward, uh, much further forward, as I think I'm going to try to show you, and on the campaign trail in 1972, which, as I've mentioned, is a complete shutout for the opposition. He observes in the campaign trail that in a number of constituencies, uh, three precisely, issues of race, language, religion have been raised and exploited by the opposition. Very soon after the election, in the same month actually, Mr. Lee writes a letter to MPs and he suggests that Chinese MPs should help minority ones contiguous to them on the electoral map. And he says that pairings should be made so that each can look after each other's interests. And for some time, he says in this letter, he's wondered how to overcome this problem of languages and dialects, especially for the non-Chinese MPs. And I quote this letter, and this will also help to calm down voters agitated by chauvinistic appeals. The problem is going to last for a long time. It may be a full generation, some 20, 25 years perhaps, before we can have a population that talks a common language. But this simply has to be done. The sacrifice of time and effort pay, will pay off in time for the next elections. For those of you who know the history, end quote, for those of you who know the history, of course, this links very much further forward to the, the genesis of the GRC idea, which is implemented in time for the 88 election. Then, much later, Lee had expressed concerns about patterns of voting and concerns that young people might be tempted to vote along racial lines, having forgotten uh, some of the history that my previous speaker has just spoken about. And this might in turn lead to a lack of minority representation in parliament. I would trace this back, the 80s, to what he tells MPs in 1972, even though the link is obviously not fully formed. Personally, I'm not sure why he did not push this idea harder in the early 1970s. There may have been other pressing issues at hand. But later in the 1980s, he tries again, and this is on record against resistance faced by MPs and minority MPs in particular. But he tries again and succeeds. I'll com conclude by making a simple observation. Although Lee generally preferred a creative and adaptive reuse of institutions already present on the ground, and this has been written about by others, my view is that he's prepared to push the envelope and make things anew when he spots problems very, very early on problems which could become quite big unless dealt with. And this is something which certainly is a persistent idea. It's per percolated down to the generation of his successors. So there you have it. A matchless level of acumen and foresight. Uh, it's a, a kind of political intelligence, I, I don't have a better word for it, which seems to come out fully formed for someone in particular who has no serious or, or official political apprenticeship. As he himself speculated uh, towards the end, after his passing, researchers, enterprising doctoral students would perhaps go through his papers and try to divine art, write monographs on his thinking and where does this idea come from, where does that idea come from. And I think others can take that up. But for my part, I'm simply thankful that he had these qualities and took care to ensure that these were passed on to those who came after him, to whom he had entrusted the care of Singapore. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sashi. Can we, can we now invite uh, Dr. Jay Shankar to come to the podium? Uh, provost, my fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen, 
Uh, I would like to thank the LKY school uh, for to inviting me on an occasion that I know is very important for Singapore. As a high commissioner uh, in Singapore about a decade ago, I had the privilege of meeting Lee Kuan Yew, of talking to him, of listening to him, of occasionally arguing with him, tactfully. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I would say, in many ways, learning from him. Uh, when I finished my uh, tenure in Singapore, I was posted as ambassador to China. Uh, and when he learned of it, uh, uh, he spent some time talking to me about China. Uh, it was a subject where he had a lot of views and a lot of experience. Uh, and I must say, uh, my, my farewell call on him, I think which is supposed to be about half an hour, ended as a two hour discussion. And I would say probably it was the best value for time that I got in my life. And, and I must uh, also say that a lot of what he said, uh, the insights he gave me, I would remember them in my stay in China. Now, a year ago when he passed away, uh, a number of world leaders uh, came to Singapore. Uh, I think their presence here uh, reflected the personal respect they had for him. Uh, but it also spoke of the impact that he made on the world and on them personally. Among them was the Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi. And uh, when I was invited by the LKY school to come here, I mentioned it to Mr. Modi. And uh, I asked him at some point a few days ago uh, what his thoughts were when he was in Singapore at that time. I mean, in a sense, I didn't use those words, but really, you know, what, what, why did you go? What was your sense of, of Lee Kuan Yew? And uh, I, I would like to share with you uh, some of what he said. I'm using my words, not his, because I, I cannot think of a better way of conveying to you the impact that he made on the world. For someone like uh, Prime Minister Modi, uh, Lee Kuan Yew was unique because he actually embodied change in a lifetime. That he did something so dramatic within the space of a few years that for any political leader in Asia or other parts of the world who's trying to modernize their society, uh, Lee Kuan Yew really stood out. Uh, Yes, you know, uh, there are more developed parts of the world, but in most cases, development was very evolutionary. Even, even in Asia, if you look at the experience of Japan, for example, it took Japan many, many years to, uh, to uh, reach where it did. But uh, I think uh, what Lee Kuan Yew in many ways meant for leaders outside was, he was a pioneer in that respect, an example, I would say, even a model of a leader who could, who could uh, change a society very dramatically within a very, within 20 years, if you would. And, and uh, so uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi actually told me that, look, I've sat down and studied the Singaporean experience because I couldn't find, it, I, I couldn't look, find any other experience which had a similar uh, speed and, and uh, timeline. And the, the related point was he saw what could be achieved by willpower, by leadership, by persistence, by motivation. I mean, in many ways, uh, the, the growth of Singapore in those years was the triumph of Lee Kuan Yew's will. I, I uh, accept that uh, there were more complicated, larger uh, team factors as well, but I'm, I'm uh, in a sense, conveying to you the sense from outside. Now, more interesting, he saw the changes which took place in Singapore as changes to practical steps, that there were a series of building blocks, uh, each one of them doable, practical, but connected. And the change that happened was a cumulative change. 
And he also, Mr. Modi also felt, looking back, that probably uh, Mr. Lee gave much more thought to uh, policies and campaigns and uh, views than would seem apparent at first glance. And, and uh, an interesting example he gave me was, he said, look, look, for example, at the campaign to clean Singapore. Now, it was easier to establish Singapore's identity by cleaning Singapore because building Singapore has a longer timeline. And, and if, you, if you really want to create a, a sort of a, a national identity, heighten social awareness, uh, 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 strengthen team spirit within the country, uh, that, that whole sense of uh, civic uh, responsibility was something which was actually uh, a very intelligent, a very perceptive way of doing so. And of course, uh, I think the importance that Mr. Lee gave to human resources as a driver of growth today uh, is a no-brainer. Perhaps it wasn't that apparent uh, 50 years, 60 years ago. And uh, I think the, the last point made was, in a sense, he created a brand. Others created nationalism. Uh, but the difference being that uh, in a, the achievements, you know, the, the progress was reflected uh, through achievements and projects rather than by appealing to identity or emotion. So uh, if one today stands back and compares Singapore to other societies in similar situations, or other societies not, you know, uh, perhaps a little different. Uh, I think you can see the difference that Lee Kuan Yew made. And uh, certainly for someone like uh, Prime Minister Modi, Lee Kuan Yew was a leader who saw the future and was, was very uncompromising about trying to get there. Now, I'll make a small diversion. I want to tell you a little bit about what's happening in India, and you'll understand why I am doing this. There, are, there is today a big campaign of change in India. Uh, these, this campaign is being driven through uh, a series of initiatives. And let me share with you some of those initiatives, and you will realize why they all sound so familiar. One is something called Swachh Bharat, which is Clean India. One is something called Ganga Rejuvenation, clean up the riverfront, deal with the pollution. Then there is Skill India, which is where you uh, improve the capabilities of your human resources so that in our case, they can serve a, a bigger campaign called Make in India, which is a manufacturing promotion campaign. Then there's a campaign called Translated into English uh, Imperfectly, a sort of save your daughter, educate your daughter, which is close the gender gap campaign. Then there's a smart cities initiative. There's an easier to do business initiative. There's stress today on owning housing, on, create, on modernizing infrastructure, above all in changing the mindset. And that, I would say, was Mr. Lee's lament of India, when you read his writings, and uh, he's often uh, you know, disappointed or critical uh, of, of the progress that India had made then. So listen to what I'm telling you about what is happening in India, and do reflect on where these ideas came from, what is the model that we are looking at, uh, what is it that today inspires us uh, to, to look at this uh, on, on the scale at which we are doing. Now, as I mentioned, uh, after Singapore, I went to China. I spent uh, four and a half years in China. And uh, I, I was struck, uh, I think it, it, was, it was not surprising because I came from Singapore, at how much of an influence Singapore had had on China. I met officials in Chinese provinces, local governments, in companies, many of whom had been in this institution or in other institutions in Singapore. Uh, 
when you went to Chinese cities, you know, you, you sort of, you went into a Chinese city and say, well, you know, this looks familiar, but I've never been here before. You looked at a Chinese airport and said, oh, that also looks familiar. I wonder, you know, where that came from. And, and you know, the, the ripples of Su Chao, I think in many ways, uh, has, has had a huge impact on the Chinese uh, industrialization and manufacturing process. But I, I certainly, uh, and, and I grant you, I, I had a predisposition here, but I certainly left China with a sense that uh, the impact that Singapore had had in helping China make that transition uh, in the then years into the uh, Jiang Zemin and later years was, was really very, very profound. So when I was asked to speak on what was the impact that Lee Kuan Yew had on the world? If he could impact, and I'm giving you two examples, two and a half billion people, what more can I say? And I, I think that's a point today that Singaporeans should reflect on. Now, it's easy to bracket Mr. Lee as one more of the Asian modernizers, you know, Asia, after all, from, from the 19th century, uh, has had a series of modernizations, Japan, uh, uh, Korea, Taiwan, ASEAN, later China. Um, and, uh, uh, but, but I, I, I would uh, suggest to you that while the Singapore model itself has its impact, which I've spoken to you about, uh, there was a Lee Kuan Yew 2.0, which is he now becomes bigger than a Singaporean leader and slowly emerges as an Asian leader. And if you look today, uh, I, I think it can be said with very little dispute that he not only br built brand Singapore, but he's also in many ways the brand builder for Asia's modern leadership. After the Second World War, and as colonialism came to an end, you actually had a first generation of Asian leaders, Nehru in India, Mao in China, Sukarno in Indonesia. But Lee Kuan Yew was part, was part of a second generation. And the difference that he made was that more than the first generation leaders, uh, his uh, USP in a sense was he took the spirit of the people and channeled it not into identities and nationalism, but more into success, into building a quality of life, and into a sense of competing with the rest of the world. So I would, uh, I would actually, in some ways, see him as the father of Asian competitiveness. Yes, each Asian country had its leaders. People would see, yes, this person was the father of our nation or the leader of our nation. But if you, if you look back on the history of Asia since the 1950s, 60s, and try to pick one figure who has a cross-national relevance, uh, I, I think uh, the, the sort of the list is pretty short. Uh, the second, uh, uh, point I would make in this 2.0 incarnation that I present to you is that he also made Asia understand, and I refer to my country particularly in this regard, that Asia's revival is actually linked to globalization. That, uh, that Asia, there are limits to autarkic development uh, and that you have to unleash the potential that at the end of the day, Asia is blessed with people rather than only with resources. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you, his writings, his speeches, his assessment, his criticism, his contrasts, a lot of this period, and this is actually a period where he's no longer the Prime Minister of Singapore, but he, he emerges in that period actually as a, as a uh, I would say, a taller, broader uh, leader, uh, who, who, who has a message beyond his, his country. Now, the period when I came to Singapore, 
was when I think Lee Kuan Yew was in a 3.0 incarnation, where he actually is an international leader. That from, from uh, a sort of, uh, uh, I would say, a, a driver of development uh, to uh, a sort of a, a thought or an example for, for the continent, he is now a, a sort of a geopolitical guru. Uh, that he is, he is uh, actually an exponent of realism, uh, who, who speaks to other leaders, uh, in fact, advises many leaders. Of, and no, it's no longer now Asia that is listening to him. It is also Europe. It is also the United States. I mean, there are very few parts of the country, world which now don't know him or don't uh, hear him with a degree of respect. And I would, in this period, actually say he comes out as a sort of a world-class practitioner of balance of power. That here is a person who, who actually uh, uh, both guides Asia through a difficult process, as well as explains Asia to the rest of the world. And again, I, I think in this, my sense is he was drawing on a, on a very difficult period in Asia, the 60s and 70s, the Vietnam and post-Vietnam years. Uh, and, uh, uh, at, you know, the, the, uh, there was, at that time, a lot of doubts uh, about who would be underwriting the global commons, what can be relied on, uh, what is the, Asia looked very unstable at that time. And my sense is that uh, today, that, that, uh, those views, those uh, experiences he had, the advice he gave, the vision he had of how to manage a very complicated uh, Asian political play, uh, I think that is uh, one way in which a very large part of the world is going to remember him. And I say so because Asia today continues to be marked by an absence of security architecture, of an agreed security architecture. It sees and will continue to see shifts in economic and military power. You have the reemergence of a country like Japan, which had taken itself out of the equation in many ways. Uh, there are fluctuations in US power uh, and in US confidence, uh, and uh, in a sense, in the, in the American mood. Uh, so with all these imponderables, uh, uh, a sort of, I, I think someone who, who taught uh, other Asian uh, uh, leaders and uh, people like me in the, in the, uh, who, who do diplomacy for their livelihood, uh, a sense of managing uh, a large continent, I, I think, is someone who would be valued and remembered for a long time. Let me just... Uh, end with two remarks. One, all that I have said, I think you know that this this 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 uh, paradigm that I've given you, this is in a sense Singapore's travel as well. And I think uh, for, for the rest of the world, the journey that Singapore and Lee Kuan Yew made are indistinguishable. I mean, there is a dynamic there uh, that, that, you know, we, we sort of see uh, the, the two as, as uh, inseparable. And uh, I, I myself, uh, you know, I, I spoke to you about the meetings I had with, as a high commissioner with him in Singapore. I also traveled with him uh, to India, I think twice if my memory serves me right. Uh, and I remember once going uh, for, uh, for a board meeting, I think of Merrill Lynch, of the International Board Meeting of Merrill Lynch. And we arrived at a hotel, and he told me, he said, you know, High Commissioner, uh, uh, please introduce me. I don't know a lot of people in India anymore. So uh, would, you, would you please stay with me and introduce me to a few people? So we enter this big tent uh, at the Imperial Hotel. Uh, and uh, he comes in. I'm like two steps behind. And there's just this wave of people who come at us. And you know, I mean, it's a virtual stampede. So I, I sort of leave him uh, to it, and I walk away and uh, go to get myself a drink. And there's somebody standing out there, 
Uh, and this was a person, I think, the provost quoted, Henry Kissinger. And he looked at Lee Kuan Yew and said, trust him to get all the attention. <laughs> uh, now, I told myself that day, here is a person who's 85. And if this person at 85 can uh, induce so much enthusiasm in people who were 25, because most of these people rushing at him were all people who were young enough to be my children. Uh, I said, you know, this was truly a person who made an impact on the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, <laughs> Professor Chanjing Chi. Provost of NUS, Professor Tanning Chai. Your Excellencies, members of the Diplomatic Corps, ladies and gentlemen. We've just heard three excellent presentations on Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. And I want to thank Dr. Jai Shankar in particular, Foreign Secretary of India, for taking time out, flying all the way to Singapore, and taking time out of his busy schedule to share his thoughts with us. It takes, <laughs> it takes someone who comes from the outside to open our eyes, to see us for ourselves, and not to stint you know, in sort of seeing really how much we have achieved. So thank you very much, Dr. Jai Shankar. Clap again. <laughs> now, um, every uh, speaker began by saying that how much, uh, how they were linked to Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. I knew Mr. Lee Kuan Yew as an academic, as a young academic. I was writing about him, writing about PAP politics. It wasn't such a great relationship then. <laughs> then I came to know Mr. Lee Kuan Yew really when I became a diplomat in the Singapore Foreign Service. And it has been my privilege to know him and to serve him and Mrs. Lee Kuan Yew and accompany them on so many trips. Uh, certainly during the 16 years I was ambassador in Washington. Now, today as chairman of the Lee Kuan Yew Center for Innovative Cities, I thought it would be most appropriate for me to speak about Mr. Lee's contributions to the physical transformation of Singapore. Now, until a couple of years ago, this aspect of Mr. Lee's role has not been closely examined. Mr. Lee thought about Singapore as a country, as a nation in the making. He also thought about Singapore as a place, a physical entity, a piece of real estate. Now, rarely have we seen a leader who so completely and deeply understood the linkage between values and abstract ideas and translating those values into a physical proposition or putting those ideas into a physical form. Building a nation to Lee Kuan Yew was not just about instilling a system of values in his people creating a bureaucracy, a public service that is honest and upholds the highest standards of performance. As important was the vision and the planning of the city-state. What I have to say to you now is not original. In 2013, to honor Mr. Lee Kuan Yew on his 90th birthday, the Lee Kuan Yew Center for Innovative Cities and the Center for Livable Cities, uh, we are not the same, eh? <laughs> organized a conference on Lee Kuan Yew and the physical transformation of Singapore. A book will be published from that meeting, and I believe is going to come out at the World Cities Summit. So get ready to get a copy. Today, I would like to focus on Mr. Lee's ideas about a green Singapore. <laughs> 
and a clean Singapore. Singapore, the garden city, which today has morphed into a city in the garden. Now, you may well ask, was Mr. Lee Kuan Yew a natural gardener? Did he have time to smell the flowers? He certainly did. And he made time to look into so many details. That is what many who worked closely with him will testify. From the moment of Singapore's unanticipated independence in 1965, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and his colleagues were seized with the challenge of making this newly independent city-state a going concern. How would they distinguish it, Singapore, from other countries in the region, which had much more land, much more resources, much more people? How would they induce others to come to Singapore, to invest in Singapore, as he explained his, in his memoirs, and I quote, after independence, I search for some dramatic way to distinguish ourselves from the other third world countries. I settled for a clean and green Singapore. One arm of my strategy was to make Singapore into an oasis in Southeast Asia. For if we had first world standards, then businessmen and tourists would make us a base for their business and tours in the region. This is from the third world to the first. Then again, he said, to achieve first world standards in a third world region is to set out to transform Singapore into a tropical garden city. Nothing expressed Singapore in its early days as a first world country, more than the drive down Nickel Highway from Changi Airport to the city, which is tree lined with plants and shrubs growing abundantly, colorfully, healthily along the road divide. The visitor immediately grasps a sense of well being and a culture of maintenance in the place, which is what sets a developed country apart from a less developed country, the culture of maintenance. Have you noticed how many capitals in the region now have done the same thing on the road from the airport to downtown? Now, some are better maintained than others, but Singapore started it. Mr. Lee was perceptive in understanding what was required to project development. In truth, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew was already playing with the idea of a green Singapore before independence, that is before 1965. Not so clearly and purposefully, perhaps, but the first tree planting campaign was launched in 1963, before we became independent. And he said, when I planted my first tree at Holland Road Circus back in 1963, it was to make Singapore green. Now, he was a man before his time. He emphasized green before it was fashionable to be green. Mr. Lee is a constant learner. I think those of you who know him know that. He is constantly asking questions. He's learning everywhere. When I was accompanying him in uh, Washington on his trips, I was just telling the panelists before we came here, he will ask you all kinds of questions. It's stressful. You know, <laughs> we drove past Boston University and he turned around and asked me, how many students are studying here? My thought was, how should I know? You know? <laughs> but I said 30,000, which was about the size of a state, big state university, and I found out it was 31,000. Just in, on his last visit to Washington, we were driving around New York first, New York before Washington. He turned around and he said to me, why are all the women dressed in black? You know, he was interested in all these details. So I said, oh, Minister uh, MM, it's because they can switch from office work to a dinner and a date afterwards. Put on a string of pearls, put on some earrings, and you're ready for the evening. Oh, I see, he said. <laughs> 
<laughs> then in Washington, we were driving around Washington, and he looked out of the car window again. He said, why are all the hems of the women's skirts uneven? I said, uh, this is a trend now, uneven hemlines. <laughs> I said, um, I don't wear them. <laughs> it's for the younger girls. <laughs> so he was always asking questions, always learning. So he's a constant learner. When he visited the United States for his sabbatical stint in Harvard in 1968, he picked up many ideas. For instance, he was flying over the New England Sound from Logan Airport, when he realized that the noise pollution from the planes circling to land in Boston was absorbed by the flight over the water and not the city. When he came home to Singapore, he wanted to relocate Pai Labor Airport to Changi so that the planes could fly over the water. Now on another trip, in 1970 in Boston, Mr. Lee recalled he saw cars all lining up at garages. He asked why they were lining up at the garage. And he was told, once a year you must have a garage to certify that your car is up to a certain standards, the emission, the brakes, etc. Otherwise you can't renew your license, that's Boston. So Mr. Lee thought, why don't we have such a rule in Singapore? <laughs> so he came back to Singapore and started Viacom, Singapore's first vehicle inspection. So that's where he picked up some of his ideas. And in fact, Mr. Lee said, you know, there are cities before us, you know, he uh, encouraged his officials, go out, find out what are the mistakes they made, don't repeat them. Find out what is good, come home and replicate them. So we are not proud. We learn from others and we are constantly learning. The years of the 1960s, 70s and 80s saw a hectic program of building public housing and road widening and concrete bridges and flyovers. Now not wanting a cement jungle, greening was a conscious response to Singapore's rapid industrialization and urbanization. Creepers were grown covering the concrete overhead bridges. I was told that Mr. Lee Kuan Yew himself personally chose that particular creeper that you know grows like clinging ivy covering all the bridges. And I remember everyone called it the Lee Kuan Yew creeper. <laughs> <laughs> In May 1967, the Garden City vision was formally introduced to the population to transform Singapore into a city with abundant lush greenery and a clean environment to make life more pleasant. And in 1968, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew declared in Parliament that, and I quote, the improvement in the quality of our urban environment and transformation of Singapore into a garden city a clean and green city is the declared objective of the government. Now remember, again, this is the 60s we are talking about, and the environment and green was not as hot an issue as it is today. And I made the point before, he was ahead of his time. He was really ahead of his time. And an extensive greening policy ensued and Mr. Lee Kuan Yew was known as the chief gardener. Now, I can list the dates of the major greening initiatives, but that would bore you. But you should know that the Parks and Trees Unit was set up in PWD in 1973. And in the same year, the Garden City Action Committee was formed. Mr. Tan Wee Kier, the former head of N Parks, and our Mr. Gardens by the Bay said, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew read the minutes of the Garden City Action Committee when he was Prime Minister and did so even when he was Minister Mentor. And Prime Minister Go Chok Tong said, we must be the only cabinet in the world 
that reads the minutes of a Garden City Action Committee. This was how Singapore, this was how seriously the Singapore Cabinet took the concept of the Garden City. It was our competitive advantage. Mr. Tan attests to the fact that Mr. Lee was an ardent learner and he took the botanical lessons as Mr. As Mr. Tan and Mrs. and Mr. and Mrs. Lee walked around the Istana Gardens, and he learned from Tan Yi Kiet, and changed his mind upon learning the properties of plants and modified his pre preferences. So he would change his mind as he learned of the re real properties. So it's not true that he decides on something and he doesn't change his mind. He learns and he quickly changes. But there was yet another important dimension to greening, which we should all remember. And Peter Ho pointed this out in his paper, The Planning of a City State. For Lee Kuan Yew, the greening of the whole of Singapore was a matter of social equity. He understood greening to be a prerequisite for ensuring the morale of the people and a source of national pride and unity. And I quote him, he said, an elected government cannot have certain sections of the city cl clean and green when, as when the British were here, and leave the rest to fester. Squatter huts, Malay villages, no drainage, no sewers, no lavatories, open earth drains, flooded. If we did not create a society which is clean throughout the island, I believed then, and I believe now, we have two classes of people. The upper class, upper middle, and even middle class with gracious surroundings, and the lower middle class and the working class in poor conditions. No society like that will thrive. No family will want its young men to die for all the people with the big homes and those earning tall towers. And I quote him again, this is a priority that was very high on my list. Apart from finance and defense, it's a sense of equalness in the society. You can't have this sense without giving all Singaporeans a clean and green Singapore. Today, whether you are in a flat, an executive condominium, or landed property, it is clean. You don't live equally, but you're not excluded from the public spaces for everybody. It was a fundamental principle on which I crafted all policies, and it worked. So you can say, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew believed everyone should enjoy the right to a clean and green environment. And today, we talk of environmental rights. I have focused on the green initiatives and what ideas and values informed those initiatives. At the same time that a green Singapore was being implemented, there were initiatives to clean up Singapore. Clean and green came together. The 10-year cleanup of the Singapore River and Kalang Basin is well known and seems to have impressed India. This was completed in 1987. At the same time, the Ministry of Environment from 1977 led a major effort to clean up dredged rivers, cleared rubbish, and embarked on relocating squatters, backyard trades, hawkers, and lightering activities from the river to new purpose built facilities. But Mr. Lee's interest in pollution dates back to the early 70s. He told the journalist who produced a book, Lee Kuan Yew, The Man and His Ideas, and I see Han Fo Kwang sitting there, that his interest in pollution began with the news of the Minamata disease in Japan in the early 70s. It was a case of the discovery of devastating mercury poisoning that came from eating polluted fish. Mr. Lee said, he realized a small country embarking on industrialization. He had, in his words, 
no choice but to tackle the environmental pollution right from the beginning. Re retrofitting would be a disaster because they, the foreign companies here, are all multinationals. Having approved them, how do you get them to retrofit? So he set up an anti-pollution unit in the Prime Minister's office directly under himself. He took a personal interest in this matter and read up about pollution. Talked with his officials and on his travels, watched what other countries were doing. Mr. Lee was Mr. Environment long before it was politically correct to be green. Now, in fact, he would not approve of my uttering the sentence. He was not interested, he was not interested to be politically correct. He said he wanted to be correct. <laughs> Today, the greening continues. Co the concept of Singapore as a city in the garden is promoted. We now have not only green technology, but also green buildings. And we all know climate change is science and is upon us. In fact, Mr. Lee in 2006 and 2007 talked about this in his speeches, and he worried about the melting ice caps in the Atlantic and its impact on Singapore. In fact, I think we got the University of Delft to come and look at what it would cost if we built dikes, you know, in case the sea levels rose. Now, I have to say in Washington in 2006 and 2000, and seven, I was there. A few of the senior officials were full of wonderment in the administration at Mr. Lee Kuan Yew that in his late 80s, he gets it, while those sections, whole sections of the US Congress did not. <laughs> so let me now summarize Mr. Lee's uh, enduring green ideas. One, the first idea, a clean and green environment is an intrinsic part of Singapore's identity. It is the differentiator for Singapore. It signifies an orderly, efficient society. A well-planned, built environment integrating greenery wherever possible remains a testimony to Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's belief in a clean and green city. It's two. Greening is a symbol of Singapore's transformation into an attractive global city. Three, social equity is also seen and measured in access to a clean and green environment and access to green spaces and public places. Four, a quality environment produces a sense of nationhood and pride. Five, Greening has its economic benefits and is the physical proof of success and effectiveness. Six, pay attention to details in whatever you do, even in softening cityscapes. And finally, you must have long-term thinking and have foresight about the vulnerabilities of the city-state. But let me conclude that by saying that the legacy of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew his green legacy, will only live on if we Singaporeans internalize the idea of clean and green. That we must practice clean habits and not have the city be clean and practice green ideas by, you know, maybe not drinking so many bottles of plastic water and practice sustainable habits. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, ex excellent accounts. Um, and I'm sure there are many uh, questions from the audience, not only uh, in this hall, but also in another hall where there are about 200 to 300 other uh, participants. Um, and we'll take questions from both. And while you are uh, formulating your questions, I thought that I might ask uh, the first one. Something strange is happening. <laughs> OK. Uh, I. I Lighting. I, oh, I see. Lighting. These screens are coming down, uh, presumably to for the other form. Give us a video access to the other room. Ah. Okay. Anyway, um, all these accounts uh, suggest to me uh, 
or paint a picture of a clearly original, highly original person. Uh, and you also get a sense that this is a person who originated some pretty extraordinary ideas. And, and I, I think this comes out quite strongly in, 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 in Sashi's um, account. In fact, he describes it as fully baked ideas, uh, ideas that are well formulated and, and complete when they are articulated. But you also get the other side um, of this man. And I think uh, Henki gives this, this picture of a man who, who learns, who uh, uh, is influenced by uh, experiences of other places and, uh, and, and you know, uh, uh, processes these ideas and assimilates them. I, I, I wonder if um, we might hear something more from our panelists, some of your insights on where did he get his ideas from? Uh, how did he how did he process these, these ideas? You know, and if you could say something also about ideas that maybe in, in the first instance were not necessarily uh, consistent with his own ideas, how did he deal with that? How, how, how was Mr. Lee uh, as a learner? <laughs> One of us? It's, it's anyone. Well, um, I thought Heng Chi has uh, shared with us quite a number of anecdotes and examples to show that. But I can share one where, I mean, a lot of people outside of Singapore always see Mr. Lee as autocratic, you know, single-minded, and uh, never want to listen to anyone. But uh, not from my own experience. There were quite a number of instances, whether on the question of the Nanyang University, the state of the Nanyang University, um, about genes theory and um, about how do you handle multiracialism. But let me show you with one, the one example about um, the Nanyang University. There was a time when, in fact, government had decided that uh, Nanyang, they were wanted to close down the Nanyang University, partly because the Nanyang graduates themselves were finding that uh, they were becoming like second class graduates and not getting the kind of attention, the kind of salaries, the kind of uh, rating as uh, SU graduates, Singapore University graduates. So Singapore government had in fact called on Professor Dainton uh, to do a survey from Cambridge. And Professor Dainton uh, confirmed that in fact Singapore at that time needed only one university and Singapore University would be sufficient to meet the needs of Singapore. And uh, I think maybe not just a question of one university, but also Nanyang University was at that time a hotbed of uh, communist infiltration and other problems, and also the quality of the university. And so Mr. Lee had met actually a number of editors and uh, gave us a fresh statement to say that in fact, let's close down Nanyang University. And uh, the fact that he called the editors to, this, to, to assign the prior knowledge uh, was interesting. And in fact, all the editors, including myself, a non-Chinese, who may not have the kind of sentiments as many Chinese would have on Nanyang University, we all disagreed with Mr. Lee. And we told him that Nanyang University is more than a question of numbers, question of rating. Nanyang University represented something very more serious, something of heritage, something of culture, something of the overseas Chinese, the Nanyang, Nanyang people. And uh, we, in fact, recommended that rather than closing the Nanyang University, government should actually look at it, re-look at it, and see how we can save Nanyang University. And um, he was, he, Mr. Lee tried very hard to convince us, try and convince us that, in fact, they have done their survey, they've done their uh, interviews, and they've done all their research, and in fact, that's the right decision. But to our pleasant surprise, in fact, later on we found out that Mr. Lee had withdrawn that statement and in fact came out with another position by the government to actually save Nanyang University in a two-phase kind of, two-stage kind of uh, approach by converting Nanyang University to a Nanyang Technological University Institute and then later Nanyang University. And I think we, we all know what Nanyang University is about today in terms of world ranking and world ranking. So Mr. Lee does listen, uh, and he's open-minded, and not only on the case of Nanyang University, and in fact, many other areas where, in fact, we engage and we exchange views. Thank you very much.
I'd like to take a stab at the question, uh, Kenneth. Uh, you asked where does he get his ideas from. As I've said, he learns all the time. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew is constantly learning and asking questions. If you read from third world to first, there are chapters where he describes all his different visits to different countries. At one level, he said he went to the Commonwealth uh, Conference uh, as the leader of Singapore. And he flew into, was it in London or whatever capital? And he flew alongside, he came, he came out of the commercial plane, SIA, you know. But there, was, there were two African delegations, African leaders coming out of those planes. They're private planes. And he thought to himself, how can they afford to come in private planes? You know. And the planes are going to be parked there, he said. How much are they paying to the airport? <laughs> you know, and these are the very same countries that were asked for aid of other countries. So he resolved then that Singapore would never own a private plane. So today, you don't have Air Force One, Air Force Two. All our leaders fly in private, in the commercial planes. And I will tell you, I was at the nuclear summit in Washington, and there were so many delegations that flew into Andrews Air Force Base, leaders coming in their private planes. Prime Minister Lee, Lee Sien Lung, came on the shuttle from New York and landed in Washington Airport, you know, the Ronald Reagan Airport. And I remember the desk officer from the State Department who went with me to receive the Prime Minister and uh, one of the uh, DASs said that they were so stunned to find that Singapore, the Singapore Prime Minister flew commercial and flew on the shuttle. Of all the countries in, you know, who can afford it, we chose not to. I said yes, because Mr. Lee Kuan Yew decided we were not going to have private planes for the leaders. So where did he learn this? On his trips. Let me also say, in one of the uh, chapters in the memoirs, or the mem you get a lot of stuff in the memoirs. <laughs> he said he went to the, um, he arrived in Washington and he was on a state visit. And I think it was Nixon who was then the, or was it Reagan? I can't remember now. Who was the president? I think it was uh, Reagan. 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 That's right, Reagan. And uh, he watched Reagan as Reagan greeted the guests. He said, how would he know all these people? He noticed that President Reagan never said, how are you? How do you do? Sorry, how do you do? Because that would signal you don't know who this person is and you haven't met the person. So he said, and how's the family? How are you? So he said, ah, that way you avoid the awkwardness of showing that you can't remember who this person is. <laughs> <laughs> so little, little things, little tricks. So he was learning as on these trips. Yes, I think the diplomats know <laughs> what it is. <laughs> but he also, I believe, um, learned through just analysis, through watching. For instance, he watched what was happening in, to the welfare state in Britain, and in Europe, and in Australia. And he decided Singapore would not take that path. He didn't have to go to those countries. He knew what was happening in the system. So he and his cabinet colleagues came to the conclusion that Singapore would not you know, follow the Western welfare state system. And uh, so we had our securities, we had our social safety nets, but it was different. So I would say, you know, some of his ideas he would learn and he would read and put two and two together. Mm. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, I'll just uh, come in briefly Please. here. I think there's a danger that people tend to forget that the first generation of political leaders who were with Lee in the difficult uh, formative years were in some ways actually his equals. And I'm thinking particularly of uh, Ko Ping Su, but there were others. Ko Ping Su, Singapore's uh, defense minister at the time and later Minister for Other Portfolios. I, I'm mentioning his name because he has the wherewithal, the intellectual prowess, the gumption to come up to 
Mr. Lee, whom he's known for a long time, and say, Harry, you're talking rubbish. You know? And quite often this happens, this to and fro, the intellectual uh, power play of ideas, with others, particularly with Dr. Go, and not just that, when Go is in charge of, let's say, Ministry of Interior and Defense, he will tell Mr. Lee, say, Harry, there's this complicated manual on technical armament, you've got to read this. And Lee will say, well, why? I don't have the time, I'm bu busy prime ministering, right? But you have to do this because it's for the good of the nation state, the armed forces building up. You have to know what you're getting into. So that's part one. Part two, as Hengxi has mentioned, is the reading. You will be baffled by the sheer range of, I wouldn't exactly call it erudition, but the hoovering up of information, not for information's sake, but keen to extract any iota of detail or information that can be put to the use of the nation state. Um, and he went through a phase where the kind of reading he was particularly interested in was what makes people work, what makes people tick. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have the book list, but you get the picture, how people survive concentration camps, mm. how people stuck close to the moon get back to, to uh, the planet Earth, what makes the NASA's right man the right stuff, and so on. He's very interested in that, because that obviously has obvious knock-on applications for building a, a meritocracy for an elite core of people who will later on run, run Singapore. A, a final point, and, and those of you who are Lee Kuan Yew aficionados will probably know this. I mean, his complete papers, his interviews, his speeches have all been published. It's a monumental 20 volume uh, effort, which I heartily recommend you, you purchase if you have the money. But what is very, very clear when you go through this, uh, as some people have done, is the sheer amount of time he makes available for journalists, not a statesman, journalists, subject matter experts anybody, it doesn't matter if you're at that particular high level of hierarchy, if you have an interesting view, he will make time for you, sometimes over and above the objection of protocol or the ministry which suggests that actually you don't, you don't need this person, because that's how he actually finds out, particularly later on when he, time, age and the constraints of energy have caught up on him, he feels as, as if he has to know what makes other countries work, and I think that's very, very important to him, almost right till the end. Well, uh, you know, uh, I was reflecting on this when you were all talking, and I think from my more, much more limited experience, uh, look, he was obviously a person of very strong convictions and beliefs, and I think everybody knows that. Uh, but I had one occasion challenging him on something which he very deeply believed in, uh, which was a meritocratic approach to life. And you, I think all of you know how deeply he believed that. And the issue was, an Indian politician had come and spoke, you know, he had discussed with him what we call reservations, uh, affirmative action. And uh, uh, I think Lee Kuan Yew had this view that s the southern part of India, from where, by the way, most uh, Singaporean Indians come from, was more developed and was uh, more progressive than the northern part of India. And he uh, had the, also the impression that part of the reason was that uh, reservations, uh, affirmative action was practiced more uh, in the north. Now, I took issue with that and actually told him that the reason why the south had progressed was the reservations had come earlier and had, and this wasn't a merit, of, you know, it was not an issue of merit, it was an issue of access to education. Uh, and somewhere you, if you don't give access, you don't get merit. Uh, I don't think he liked what he heard, uh, I, but he listened. And, you know, my sense was here's a person who's getting something new and he's listening to you even if it goes against his grain. Now, I'd never had a subsequent conversation, so I can't say that I had any transformational impact on this issue. <laughs> uh, but I suspect I didn't. Uh, but, but, you know, I, I, you had a... I, uh, certainly, I, you, I left with the impression of a person who was open to receiving new inputs and not averse to challenging a hypothesis, but pretty confident that his hypothesis would stand uh, at the end of the day. I mean, this, this would be my brief takeaway. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let's now turn to the uh, uh, room here. Uh, we'll take a round of questions, if you don't mind. Just introduce yourself briefly. Keep your questions short and succinct, and as we always say, make sure it is a question. And it would be helpful also to say who the question is, is for. So, please. 
go ahead. And, and the others, uh, if you have questions, go to the mics. There are mics uh, along the aisles. Anthony Teo, Beijing at Lee Kuan Yew City. If I could direct the question to Foreign Secretary Dr. Jai Shankar. We hosted President Kalam when President Kalam was given an honorary PhD. And he said that if he were to do his undergraduate again, he would do it at a Singapore University. Mm -hmm. I like your point about version one, two, and three. Except that I think version three came very early. When we talk about the great ideas of Lee Kuan Yew, when you talk about strategic engagement of China and India, it was like 50 years ago. That predates Kissinger. Now, you have been in Singapore and in China. You happen to be a very skillful nuclear negotiator. But 50 years ago, it was non-aligned movement, very close, China and India. It was Indi, Chindi, Bye Bye. But now there are tensions and some degree of rivalry and some degree of engagement. From your perspective of having been in China, here, and in India, what perceptual feel is there from the Chinese side and from the Indian side as to this tension of engagement and rivalry. Thank you. Any more questions? Can we? Any questions? Perhaps we might uh, uh, get a response while you formulate your thoughts, and also we're going to go to the, the other room uh, after this to get questions from them too. Uh, well, uh, you know, I was putting uh, LKY 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, not so much from the uh, from a timeline of his ideas. I, I think uh, at least reading uh, the Singapore story, he was always an international person. And uh, he, a lot of leaders at that time were actually genuinely internationalists by virtue of education, training, travel, etc. I was putting it more in terms of how the world saw him. The world saw him initially as a successful Singaporean leader. Then the world saw him as a Singaporean leader who had a larger regional uh, relevance and message. And then finally the world saw him actually, frankly, as a, as a uh, wise statesman who was bigger, you know, uh, I mean, so you didn't think of him as Singapore, you thought of him as Lee Kuan Yew, you know, global citizen who had uh, things to say to the rest of the world. So I was, I was giving you the listener's viewpoint rather than the originator's viewpoint. On the issue of China, you know, one of the, uh, the I, I mentioned to you that I had two, three meet, two, two talks actually with him specifically on China. Look, uh, the, the issue between India and China is, yes, we have disputes, but if the relationship remains narrow, naturally the dispute looks very big. If you broaden out the relationship, and a lot of other things happen. You know, today China, for example, is India's second largest trading partner. Now, if you think of China, not just as a country with whom you have a border dispute, but you also think of China as a country with whom uh, you, you, know, you do business, you, you import stuff, you, they are in. Chinese investments in India, by the way, have increased very markedly in the last two years. So if China is an investor, a trader, uh, someone with whom you make common cause on, say, climate change, then the canvas is broader. Then that dispute doesn't have the salience which it does earlier. And I, I, my sense of his thinking was that this broadening of the India-China relationship was good for both countries and good for Asia. I mean, that would be my answer to you. Thank you. Uh, I wonder if we can now turn to the other room and see if there are questions from that room. Ah, there yes. we are. <laughs> I'm uh, Dr. Pua Kai Hong from the Lee Kuan Yew School, and I teach uh, health policy. This question is directed to uh, Professor Chan Heng Chi, my, my old boss, the uh, first director <laughs> of the Institute of Policy Studies, where I was uh, the first adjunct fellow. I was working on health policy. I was quite intrigued with your observation, Heng Chi, about uh, Mr. Lee's uh, uh, being the chief gardener and his concept of the, green, the clean and green Singapore. 
And perhaps this is where I think the indirect contributions of uh, Mr. Lee's policy in environmental health has created a kind of uh, uh, very healthy city-state. In fact, we have the best health indicators uh, according to the Lo Bloomberg Index. We also have the uh, lowest infant mort mortality rate of uh, below 1.5 per thousand live birth. And this in part is indirectly related to the clean and green uh, emphasis that he's first started, you know? Not only with the housing board, uh, uh, moving people away from the filth and the squalor of the old slums into modern uh, housing that is uh, served by portable water and sanitation and the tremendous impact it has on public health standards. And also the anti-litter campaign, the anti-spitting campaign, and of course Mr. Lee himself was a bit of a health uh, freak, you know, in the sense that he stopped his cabinet from smoking. He very early, as soon as he got his evidence on, on what uh, lung cancer can be caused you know, by uh, cigarette smoking, and he himself had uh, a heart problems, as you know. But he did stop some of his uh, colleagues who were chain smokers, like Raju Ratnam and uh, uh, Goking Sui and so on, which is really amazing. So I'm just wondering whether, uh, Professor Chan, whether you have any other insights about this clean and green and what Mr. Lee's uh, own health habits you know, had profound uh, sort of impact on our own policies, whether it's a direct or indirect uh, influence. Because very much later, he was our poster boy. I was running those health campaigns. I remember having to work my boss to persuade Mr. Lee to pose for pictures where he was swimming and where he was exercising. And he was a basic <laughs> a poster boy for our public health campaigns. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can we have some other questions from that room? Are there other questions? Yes, my name is Frank Fukutabri. Uh, you know, I was thinking, how, how do we tie these four speakers together? <laughs> the theme that runs through, and this morning I heard on the BBC about Andy Grove, the, mm. the chairman of, um, I think, Intel. Uh, Intel. And uh, the quote that was given was, you got to be paranoid to survive. And if you sum up Lee Kuan Yew's ideas and all that, it was paranoia that actually drove him. Because he had an idea of what Singapore is, a very clear idea. Singapore must grow, Singapore must make lives better for everybody. So, you know, everything that ran through him was, how can I do that? So it's, it's really paranoia. And uh, if, if you think about the way he dealt with dissent, it was clearly, you know, any source, any wellspring of dissent must be removed. So what he did, you know, where are the sources of dissent? One, opposition. Okay, Operation Cold Store. We have church workers, Operation Spectrum. We have students, as you know, and students are always a source of dissent, whether it's in Hong Kong or South Africa. So what did we do? I was one of those who had to go to university. I had to have a certificate of suitability. If I didn't have that, I couldn't go to university. So. Another source of dissent, newspapers. How do you get rid of Eastern Sun, Singapore Herald, Nanyang Siang Bao. Now we have a very cooperative press in SPH. <laughs> what else? Unions. Unions now, you know, there's so many unions, strikes and everything, and it's not good, not good for business, and we know that business improves Singapore. So what did we do? Now we have NTUC, one union, very cooperative, the head is a minister. So, I mean, that's really, to me, paranoia. He knew what Singapore is. Anything that gets in his way must be removed. And he did that very beautifully. <laughs> now, of course, there are some side effects of all this. You know, that's probably for another session. Uh, can I have some comments on that? Okay. Can we maybe take one more question? And I think we'll have enough to go down the panel. But can we take one more question from the other room? Is there any? If not, then uh, uh, paranoia, health freak, uh, gardener, and so on. Yeah. Uh, perhaps uh, maybe you want to start with uh, Sakit? So paranoia we'll come down tends to, uh, to impute a certain lack of rationality to a man who, as far as I knew him, was uh, extremely rational, calculating, and never did something unless he had fully thought this through and in the event of a serious issue like a national security issue, had fully consulted people who in the, were in the know or had to be in the know, including his cabinet. I, I did not have the, the privilege of 
going through some of these uh, periods in history that are mentioned by, by the, the questioner, except maybe uh, later on in the 80s. Um, if he was so keen to kill off the various wellsprings of dissent, why not just ab abolish parliamentary democracy? Uh, he did not. What I find, and I mentioned this earlier, find him actually lamenting more was the absence of uh, a well-constructed functioning opposition which could actually have brought Singapore forward or further in its view at an earlier stage. And if the question has not been asked, but if the question were to be asked, why didn't the PAP do something about this? Well, you asked the generation back then and probably even the generation back now, it's not the business of the ruling party, I think, to bring forward the, the, the fortunes of the respective array of opposition. That has always been in the party's DNA. Um, <coughs> Rather than paranoia, and this is a personal view, when it comes to clamping down on political oppo opposition, what I actually see uh, is a rational uh, aversion or suspicion of a kind of subversion which uh, historically and politically um, almost lost the game for the PAP. I mean, if you know Singapore's, Singapore's history, particularly when it comes to well-organized elements linked to the communist, the communist Party of Malaya, the CPM, and so on. And I think if one wants to look, if you know the history at the various clampdowns in the 60s and going through right through to the 70s, people tend to forget this, it's actually that. He doesn't mind these, he calls them somewhat unkindly, fly-by-night opposition members, and you probably know who they are and so on. He actually feels some of them are good in Parliament to act as this counterfoil that I talked about, maybe to sharpen debate if they're, if they're bright enough and all that. But what he has, a, if you want to call it a paranoia, uh, a deep ingrained suspicion about, is the kind of people who are really, in his view, subversive to bring about the, the downfall of all that he, he fought so hard to build. Uh, the final point I'll make is that he does not say this often, but he, he does say this, when these enterprising PhD researchers go through his papers and, and whatever and try to construct the history of his life, uh, he, he will want to put it on record that he has had to make hard decisions for Singapore's survival from the get-go and continued development. And he says researchers can pour through the evidence what the, the matter and material of these decisions were. He says he's had to put people away, but it was for the good of Singapore. Um, whether or not you choose to defend it, that, that's your personal issue. But I would say that um, people tend to forget sometimes that the milieu or, or the fog of conflict in the old days, in the 60s, where, in my view, and I think in the party's view, if they had not worn out, uh, they would have been liquidated. People tend to forget that. Thank you very much. I, know you. I don't want to sound fat or... <laughs> 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 uh, but there are definitions, different definitions. Of what's in fact, there are some leaders who felt that, in fact, for the good of Singapore, a certain amount of paranoia is not bad. How committed are you? How passionate are you about wanting to achieve what you believe in for Singapore? And uh, that's where I felt a certain amount of paranoia is not bad. But uh, when you relate it to examples which I mentioned just now, whether it's the opposition, media, even uh, GLCs, I suppose, NTUC, I think, again, there are various uh, interpretations of that, where you can see that, in fact, for some of the examples, if, you had, if, for example, Mr. Lee had not taken the more, I suppose, controversial, the more hardline approach to these institutions or these organizations or these areas, Singapore would have been a very different place. I know now, for example, even young people um, now using examples of, in the those days of, uh, of political upheavals, where PAP had been seen to be unfair. But um, to me, the Singapore we have now, the politics we have now, and uh, the, the, the kind of values that we have now for Singapore, I don't quarrel with. And I thought it was lucky that we had taken very hard lines in some areas where we felt it wasn't good for Singapore. I was uh, in the media. We faced the same problem. Uh, knuckle dusters being applied to some. And, uh, but we felt, I personally felt, in fact, 
for the media, which is a very important institution, we want to play a very constructive role. We want to play a role where, in fact, Singapore can move forward. We know there are a lot of complex issues, race relations for one. And if, for example, you belong to some uh, of the racial groups, I know when I was an editor, there was this issue about uh, uh, proselytization by a certain religious group where they were targeting Malays. And race, con uh, religious conversion was a very delicate issue. And in fact, that has brought about the rise of a resurgence of uh, active Buddhism, even Hinduism, which used to be a very passive religion because they saw the fear of other more uh, active groups coming in trying to convert what they saw as a very active Chinese ground, which are basically ancestor worshippers or Confucian uh, Taoists, you know. Uh, but it brought about different kind of reaction, different kind of uh, development, different kind of dynamics, which could actually destabilize the whole of Singapore. And if it had not been tough on those areas, I think Singapore would be in a, have been a different place. So there was this transition period. We felt that we had to manage. And where we can, we provide the amount of uh, dissent, dissent or different view or diversity in views, but within bounds, within limits. And this actually applied to areas which we felt are very, very sensitive, very, very delicate, especially when it comes to race and religion. Politics, you can debate about it. It has been debated. What kind of politics do you want for Singapore? What kind of opposition do you want for Singapore? I don't think uh, Mr. Lee or the ruling group, for example, have gone down hard on the uh, opposition leader now, Mr. Lau Tia Kiang, because the kind of politics that he practiced. But if you take a very uh, a negative, very anti singapore what is seen as anti-Singapore as approach, then of course the, the approach taken by Mr. Lee be, was different and would have been different. So I think for NTUC and GLCs, I think we know the arguments why, in fact, uh, the government had to go in and provide the kind of uh, support for gaps which we felt uh, was not, uh, whereas other parts of Singapore, the private sector could not provide. And I think we can see now the role played by the NTUC, the role played by the GLCs, and they have uh, brought about the kind of development, the kind of uh, skills, uh, expertise, which I think grew out of this uh, Singapore government taking the approach in developing, in providing the kind of uh, companies, the kind of institutions which was important, was seen as important for that transition period to a more stable, a more developed Singapore where I think things are a bit more open, a bit more uh, laissez-faire. Thank you very much. Ms. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, there was a question on health and whether anything about Mr. Lee's personality contributed to this healthy clean, green, and healthy Singapore. Uh, let me say that uh, Mr. Lee, Lee Kuan Yew, and the entire PAP team understood that for Singapore, our only resource is a human resource, is our location and people. And so people are precious. And Mr. Lee himself, I think, is a very disciplined person. He lives a spare life, a clean life. He's not decadent at all. And his personality tendency would be to keep healthy. I remember when we went round again, you know, in the car, he would point out to all the obese people he saw, my God, so <laughs> obese. Look at this, it's so obese. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, in our schools, we are very particular about what we sell in the tuck shops, so in the school canteen. So I think he had this sense of why waste a life? He often said, what a wasted life. So we shouldn't be wasting our lives, it's human resource. So it stems from that. And his, whole, his own sense, actually, I think the PAP leaders, whether it's just Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, but I think it's the entire team, had a shared sense of the kind of society and polity they wanted to build. And it was a society where, you know, I would say at the bottom, there was a flaw. You would not let people fall below that fall, floor. At the top, the play is free. I think now the floor at the bottom is being pushed up further and further. The play at the top, globally, people are also saying, you know, well, is it okay to make 200 million a year? How do you tax, you know? So those are the questions. But in this society, and he, Mr. Lee answered 
Charlie Rose once. There's a sense of self-esteem. You don't want to see homeless people on the streets. So there was a kind of society he was going to build, which was a fair society, a just society, a society where his people lived decent lives. And he talked of green for everybody. I think that was that sense. Uh, and just to touch on the last question of um, dissent and how Mr. Lee treated dissent, he was intolerant of dissent. You know, that's Mr. Lee. And he was more intolerant maybe than some others. But uh, I think in the end, as Zaino says, is the total package. What did he do? What he, did he build? It is Singapore is not Westminster democracy. It is a different kind of democracy. I use the word, is a quasi democracy. And we have the institutions. But it works. It works for Singapore. It's delivered results. And we talk of governance, good governance. And today, I think there are many diplomats sitting here. Democracy as a system, whether it works in the West, is now coming under stress and is open to question. So, you know, the Democrat, I think it's more important to emphasize good governance. And it is about a just society, equity, you know, and you really shouldn't be grabbing people off the streets, you know, disappearances in the night. You don't want to do that. Certainly, but you know the amount of latitude, amount of freedom, amount of democracy. I say democracy is elastic. Some societies are more democratic than others, and we are not as democratic as the United States or Britain. But we are more democratic than, and I can name a whole lot of other places too. Thank you. Uh, we've actually come to the end, That's but uh, with your permission, uh, there are a couple more questions. And w would that be okay if we just took two more questions? Uh, hi, I'm distinguished panelist. Uh, I'm Ted, and I'm still serving in national service. Uh, I'd like to ask um, before that, Singapore is heading into uncertainties, uh, be it political, economic, defense, uh, regional tensions, uh, so on and so forth. I'd like to ask, drawing from your experiences, your own personal lives, or your interactions with the late Lee Kuan Yew. What message or values would you like to impart to us youth to take Singapore in the next 50 years? Thank you. Thank you. Jillian. Good evening. I'll just keep this short and quick. Um, Mr. Zaino Avedin, I enjoyed your uh, presentation, your talk. Uh, you spoke at the end about multiracialism being a work in progress, and you referred to the current question of whether we should specify in any way in our system of elected presidency uh, the uh, uh, um, ethnicity, the question of ethnicity. Uh, I think the question is whether we should make it such that we can ensure that there will be a Malay president at some point in time. May I invite you or any other member of the panel to share with us what would be uh, the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's lens to that question. What sort of principles uh, would have guided his own comments about such a proposal, knowing that uh, the, quest the whole system of elected presidency uh, was uh, introduced by him, uh, was founded on the idea of merit-based uh, me uh, merit criteria to ensure that uh, you know, uh, what is essentially custodial powers are given to somebody who merits that role. So thank you very much. Thank you. Would you like to start? Do you want to, you want to oh, come down the row again? <laughs> Everyone, yeah. This is. Uh, oh, let's go the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> just for just variety. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, I will just take the question from the national service yes. uh, uh, officer or gentleman. The um, yes, the road ahead is very unpredictable. What would Mr. Lee have done? I think he would do exactly what he has always been doing, and I expect our political leaders to be the same. I think in dealing with what goes forward, it's not like, oh, it's all dark. You face, you know, there's terrorism, you've got to deal with it. If there's going to be armed conflict, you have to deal with it. If there's an economic slowdown, you've got to deal with it. You deconstruct each of these areas. And you think of the best policy you can adopt at that time. That's why you need good leaders who come up with the solutions for that. 
And I think on the question of terrorism, it's affecting everybody globally. I think we've got to be prepared and in dealing with terrorism, exchange of intelligence is extremely important. I cannot believe the Belgian government seems to be, they said to be not sharing information very much. I'm sorry if there's a Belgian yeah. representative here. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, it's a, it's a very sad day and you know, we feel that, but uh, I think exchange of cap um, um, uh, intelligence is very important. But you've seen the messages that have been coming. It's not what, whether it will happen in Singapore, it is when it will happen. So we are being prepared. And I think that's the best way to go forward, to be prepared. And I hope you'll do your bit then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, well, obviously I'll answer the first one too. Uh, they, look, I, you know, when I was High Commissioner here, it was the first time, unfortunately, that a Singaporean citizen was killed abroad in a terrorist incident. This was uh, during the Mumbai uh, terrorist attack. Uh, it shook this place because, uh, you know, somehow there was a sense these things happen in other places and you are immune from it. Uh, uh, again, that, you know, the, the 3.0 uh, Lee Kuan Yew that I speak about, my sense was that he was right, speaking and uh, advocating that the world was increasingly dealing with transnational challenges, but thinking nationally. Uh, and this, this gap was something which, which, was, uh, which was a vulnerability uh, for the world. And uh, uh, I mean, he was very practical about uh, uh, building international cooperation. You know, our defense, you are a national serviceman, so you know uh, how strong the defense cooperation between India and Singapore uh, is. And he was a very uh, great source of support for that uh, endeavor. In fact, he was a person who tried to do it way back in 1965. And you know, he was happy that something was delayed, but eventually got done. So. Uh, I, I, I would say his, uh, uh, you know, if, if he got his advice, it would be that, uh, you know, think internationally, network stronger, but build national capabilities. Thank you. Yeah, on the national service and the uncertainties, number one, I believe that we should always continue with national service because it's one of the more important institutions where I think we can bring about that better understanding in the context of multiracialism and, uh, and make more young of our young Singaporeans to understand what Singapore is all about. National service is not just about uh, pre being prepared for uncertainties and war, but also understanding what Singapore is all about. But provided our young understand that, because there are quite a number of young who still feel national service is a waste of time, could finish it as soon as possible, then they're wasting a very important opportunity. So I think educating the young to appreciate the value of national service and, and benefiting from it is the first starting point. Uh, and then number two, I think uh, values which I think, as Heng Shi has mentioned, values which I think, uh, enduring values and ideas which Mr. Lee himself has brought about for Singapore, I think should, we should make efforts to make sure that our children, our succeeding generations also understand that. You know, Mr. Lee, in his passing, has brought about the kind of unity, the kind of uh, togetherness in Singapore, which we have not felt for a long, long time. Partly because of democracy, the system of democracy, the one thing to have at least, you know, no matter how successful we are, without a good demo opposition, they feel it's not adequate. So it brought about a kind of disunity. But fine, I think that's part of the process of our democratic society. Uh, but how do you go about bringing about democracy without really breaking down the community, uh, breaking down the society, Singapore society to become disunited? So I think we need to have, as part of our education, I know Minister of Education always complains there's too much of uh, <laughs> demand on education, but I think we need to make sure that they understand these values. I hope we don't have to wait for another uh, one person to die to get that kind of unity again. But uh, personally, I felt that it was, I was so gratified that when we got 70%, PAP got 70% for the last election, it shows that, in fact, despite the diversity, despite the, the differences in opinion, 
at times we can stand together when we face uncertainties. And on the EP, in fact, you may like to know that uh, there are many amongst the Malays and Muslims themselves do not want a special kind of a window or a special kind of door for Malays to, to um, is it just Malays or is it minority? I suppose minority to, um, to be part of the scheme of elected president. You know, when we first became independent, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and the party chose Mr. Yusuf Ishak to be the first president and also chose Majula Singapura as a national anthem. And uh, that says a lot about uh, reminding Singaporeans of the reality of our Singapore. Of course, now we have a different, different kind of society, different kind of uh, generation, and more and more people feel Singaporean. I'm very reassured when I talk to young people, they say, please stop talking about race. Please stop sh talking about your grandfather's stories, <laughs> you know, about my experiences. We are different. We are Singaporean. We are colorblind. I'm very reassured to hear that. But when I see the world around us, the problems in Middle East, the problems in, on Palestine issue, problems in our region, and the economic uncertainties, and what impact it would have on minorities, on Malays in terms of jobs, and how it will affect their mind about multiracialism, about being united as one people, I have my concerns down the road, the next 50 years. I would like to think that we are all colorblind, we all believe we are Singaporeans, but I believe that in fact the problems of uh, race, religion, religion in particular, will come back to haunt us. And not only because of the world, what's happening around us, but also in our own country. I mentioned early on about the challenges of uh, multiracialism. So I think we cannot take this for granted. So if there are ways we can reassure that everyone has a place, whether it's elected president, everyone feels there's a chance. Ideally, we like to have the Malay candidate or minority candidate who can stand up to scrutiny and to be elected by all Singapore without having to a special privilege. But even on the question of Malay special privilege, a special position, do you know that Singapore government initiated a, a policy where Malays, Muslim, Malays who are actually doing well, they, they are no longer entitled to free education at the tertiary level. But yet, the government used the money which actually meant for them to be given to Mandaki, to be given to the needy. That's the kind of process, that's the kind of accommodation, that's the kind of change which I think even the Malay Muslim community are adapting to. So I think as we go along, we need to make adjustment, we need to make uh, improvements on our institutions, our understanding about multiracialism so that we can have better understanding, better unity, and better trust. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. This, this is uh, very, very <laughs> uncomfortable for me as a historian by training to be engaged in this series of counterfactuals. What would Lee Kuan Yew have done? And Lee Kuan Yew would have been very dismissive of this. He has this, this phrase, he calls it a parlor game. Don't play parlor games. <laughs> So I, I, I'm reluctant, but just, just very briefly, the issue of crisis is an interesting one. If you look at the Lee Kuan Yew premiership, I, I don't think I'm exaggerating to say, in the 80s, when you see the, the, the crisis coming, you use uh, opportunity and to turn it into something else or to look at least look at longer-term weaknesses in a manner where you're strengthened. Uh, and the big example would be 1985 uh, economic recession which has very uh, local and specific factors, but which is uh, attacked by a committee, which paves the way for Singapore's longer, medium-term uh, economic restructuring, which is very, very important. And I think this is subsequently encoded or hardwired into the DNA of party and government. And indeed, you can see this, you know, Dean Kisho, who's not here, likes to say, never waste a crisis. And I think this is very apposite here, because later on, when you have economic crisis, um, or rather committees in 03 and 0809, the ESC, you see the same thing. You know, don't just attack the specific economic crisis, but you know, look to the longer term good and how so Singapore can be redeveloped socio uh, socioeconomically. So that's, that's one point. 
the particular issue of terrorism is something which I know disturbing greatly because if you are a former civil servant of a particular vintage from a particular one or two ministries, at that time when J.I. arrest had just broke and 9-11 had just, just broken just before that, you would have been possibly, if the, one of the lucky or unlucky ones, one of those deluged by queries directly coming from him or routed through the, the PPS maybe on this, that, Al-Qaeda, terrorism, terrorist organization. He is really trying at that time to attack and understand the problem from, from all angles. And I'm spending some time mentioning this point because you track back to what Rukwani has been saying from the 60s, the real concern is Singapore is a delicate melange of uh, races, interests, religions, languages. Many other problems can be fixed, but Singapore is a delicate jar. Once it's dropped, can the pieces ever be put back together in a fashion where you can carry on as if nothing had happened? And I think for him, if confronted by what our leaders have been saying over the past two, three years, that look, it's inevitable, it's going to happen, start thinking about the resilience, you know? It began the counterfactual, but I think he would have been enormously preoccupied by this issue, the post-event bounce back ability, to, to use an invented word. Thank you very much. Uh, we've come to, yeah. to the end. Thank you for coming. Please join me in thanking our wonderful <laughs> panelists. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, panelists, for the insightful session. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of today's event. On behalf of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, we'd like to thank you for taking your time to attend this event. You are now invited to a reception as well as a photo exhibition on the enduring ideas of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew at the lobby of the Yu Tiong Ham building. Thank you again and have a pleasant evening.